Oh, can't hear, can't hear, can't hear. Appreciate it. All right, uh, welcome to fun with uh, James and Derek. Uh, I guess we could say um, what we thought we'd try to do today and to get prepped up for other things is just do what we're gonna call um, a mini session. So we really don't have any PowerPoint slides for this. Uh, anything else that's gonna happen. Um, we are gonna record it. And one of the things that we're trying to do for world skills is as we sit here and we, we build and we play and we design things, um, we're making what we call um, design briefs. So, you know, this is like a design brief where we just take a bunch of components and explain them and put them together. All right, uh, and then in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write some sample code for it. This is in, uh, in preparation for our next training and our next training will be bro broken down into four stages where we're gonna actually get you get, get the parts in your hands, build the base robot, get the parts in your hands, build a mechanism, okay? Put it all together, uh, build a project for that robot and then um, drive and move that robot, all right? So, you know, basically enough to get you uh, with something that you can put onto the competition and that you can uh, use as you're going through. Uh, we sent out last night, uh, and if you don't have it, not a, not a big panic, okay? Uh, because one of the ideas behind today's session is to give you thoughts and you ideas uh, on what you can do, um, and just give you a few, a few tips and tricks um, that we find uh, when we're working with the design components and so on. So what we are going to do today is in this session, we are going to build a, a slide mechanism, a lift mechanism, an elevator, all right? It doesn't have to go uh, vertical. It could go horizontal and be used for a different purpose. And it's going to use um, some of the components that are in the, uh, in the collection, all right? So eventually what we'll do is we'll, we'll build something that looks uh, a little bit like this out of the channel, okay? I can't slide this one or move it right now because it's torqued up with the motor. Uh, and this is designed just to use a DC motor to move um, back and forth, all right? This is using the new, um, the new Studica channel, the little wider channel, so we can do a few more things with it uh, because of the way that we're gonna mount the motors and talk about these in this session, okay? Uh, but we can build the same thing um, with different ideas. This is the same type of thing with the older, um, smaller channel. Um, and what we've done on this one is we had one of the servo motors on it um, to drive it back and forth, all right? Uh, as I said, as, as James and I play with different things, we're going to build these into what we call design briefs. Uh, we were just talking about the best way to do that um, this morning at 6 a.m. here. And uh, I will start, James, by saying uh, congratulations, because I think James is going to see both sides of 5 o'clock today. So I'm very happy. I always say what my father used to say, uh, if you don't see both sides of five o'clock, you've never worked a day in your life. So there's other ways that we can uh, we can do these. This is a big monster um, robot that we're working on. And on this monster robot, what we've done is we're using the rack and pinion, okay? A dual rack and pinion to do the slide mechanism. Uh, this dual rack and pinion is also um, servo driven on one side so we've gone left and right with it and up and down on another and you know in the next session we'll probably use a combination of rack and pinion and slide and belt and bully it's entirely up to you the way that you wish to do things uh, when you're going to put it together like I said this is a pretty wide robot as you can see but we did that so that we could get a big firm stable base uh, when we were designing and putting the system in with the high torque servo All right. And it's the same thing here on a different type of system. Uh, we just put things together as we go through. Now, if you had watched some of the previous sessions or been uh, participating with us before, um, I always talk about the stages required when you're gonna build and design your robot, okay? Um, how you should have your drivetrain uh, look at your drive train, work with your drive base. And this is what we're going to do in our future training. We're going to look at the drive base, okay? But then your mechanisms, your object management system, as we call it in world skills, things like that. When we're designing those, we want to design them. We may have three or four different designs we can prototype. So we go from CAD to physical design. Uh, we do some testing on it and, and we come up with that, all right? So it makes it easier. 
Uh, what we do here at the office is we use our, our uh, test jig, which is down here, okay? So this is what we had used in the training before. Take your drink out of the way, I'm gonna hold that up, all right? But we always keep our, our wonderful unit together here. This is what we build so that we can test all the functionality. Remember that we've got the Titan Quad on it. We've got the VMX. We have our camera hooked up to it. All right, we have a prototyping board that's set up on it. So this is what we used in the last session uh, for testing and training. Uh, I have a sensors on it, motor on it, and so on. Luckily, I'd have broken it if James had the battery in it right now, but we didn't. But what this also enables us to do, and we all have one here, we keep one on our desk, okay, is that when we're gonna test our mechanisms, if we have our drive-based training, we're out moving it around, with our mechanisms, we can just quickly plug these in and wire them and test them using that test station, all right? So, you know, it's a great thing to have. It also, for us, is our spare set of components. So we have an extra Titan Quad and VMX running uh, here, and then we would have one on our robot as well. Uh, it makes it easier for us to design and prototype as we go forward. All right, so let's start uh, and, and talk a little bit about uh, about what we're going to build. Okay, so I guess someone had asked how you open the 3D PDF. Um, it's just a standard PDF. So what you want to do is you want to have uh, your Adobe Acrobat, okay, uh, reader. So you have to download Adobe Acrobat reader and have that. Now, because it is a 3D PDF, it must be, uh, it must be trusted. So I actually have it open on my screen here. Uh, let's just go back in. Okay. So I have opened up the, uh, the 3D PDF on my screen. So this is just my Acrobat Viewer. I actually have Acrobat Viewer um, on the cloud when you are going to do that. Okay, now I'm going to just um, minimize that off a little bit. And you'll see what happens is if I have that 3D PDF on my screen, I'll try to open it again, okay? When it pops up, it should open in the Acrobat Reader, but what it's going to do is it's gonna ask you to trust it, all right? And the reason it wants to trust it is because it has 3D content. It's not flat, it's not 2D. Um, so, you know, it thinks maybe that you're, you know, open a strange video or something like that. So when you do open that inside your Acrobat Viewer, and all I did was double click on it and it opened in Acrobat Viewer, the first time you open it, it's gonna ask you if you wish to trust this type of content, okay? And I've set mine to always trust, all right? So once you have that inside of a regular Acrobat Viewer, then what we can do with it is we can rotate it, um, we can move it around uh, and so on, all right? Now, uh, last night, I believe you were sent the 16 megabyte step file for this that has all the components on it, all right? And you were sent the PDF parts list uh, and you were sent this in, in PDF as well, okay? Uh, you know, we like to do things uh, electronically so that you can look at that and do that. And if you've got that inside your 3DF viewer, what you can do is you can move it around. And as you work in stages, if you want, what we can do is we can do things like set up different views, okay? So inside the 3D Acrobat Viewer, there is uh, your design tree here, your model tree, okay? So what you can do with the design tree is you can go in and you can set up different views, all right? And inside of those different views, you can remove and take out components. So in this view, if I remove the bevel gear, okay, you'll see that that's my 13 tooth bevel gear, okay? I can turn that on and turn that off, okay? I'm not quite sure about this question we have. Sorry, we're asking questions as we go so that we can see it. So we're gonna um, build this slide mechanism. Uh, nothing's too fancy here when we do it. Uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second. All right. We hold it. Yeah, okay. We'll hold these up higher so that you can see them as we go. And don't worry, as we're building, we're gonna take the components and we're gonna switch the camera view so that you can see those components close up, okay? We're not building yet, I'm just talking still. That's all I'm doing, right? 
to show you how technical we are on it, um, when we sat down and put together our design for this, um, there it is, okay? So what I've got right there is a yellow piece of paper. Uh, Derek writes everything on yellow paper. Uh, these are the steps we were gonna go through. And what I would actually do with this is as I was designing this, and uh, I didn't bring it with me, is I would put this into my technical journal or my engineering notebook. So today's date, uh, what we were gonna do, parts list, how I did it, how I put it together, uh, because we're gonna document everything as we're going ahead, all right? So the first stage that we've got, and we're gonna start this, is we're gonna put together um, the, the motor mount bracket. So the first thing that we need to find if we're gonna build this is we need to find one Maverick DC motor, okay? So this is the Maverick DC motor. You're gonna need one of these um, to put together this assembly, all right? Um, it's pretty easy. I don't think I need to, uh, to tell you the parts list as we go forward with it, all right? And I'm not even sure if I put the DC motor on the required parts list, did I? I may have left it off by mistake, all right? So we're gonna take the, the DC motor and what you also wanna find is you wanna find your motor mount plate. So James will take that motor mount plate um, and he's gonna put that over. So we have the motor mount plate. Okay, so the motor mount plate part number is there. All right, that's gonna be 76140. And that motor mount uh, plate, okay, um, we're gonna put that on the motors. And what it's designed to do is it's designed to allow you to put the motor inside of a piece of channel. So you're gonna see that um, as we do it, it's very strong and it mounts different motors. So you're gonna need your motor mount plate. You are gonna need your 13 tooth bevel gear. I'll take that one off the motor that I've got. So we're gonna need that 13 tooth bevel gear. Now, when you get your bevel gears, they're gonna come in a package and most of your gears are like that. They're gonna come in two, two separate little bags and you're gonna get your gears and inside of your gears, you will get a little bag of set screws, right? So the set screws are not put inside of the gears already. So be very, very careful when you open those because you'll have a very, very small bag. And I'm just gonna grab one here. Right. So inside of, each, inside of each bag that your parts come in, there's gonna be a separate bag with your set screws in it, okay? We give them extra set screws. I think there's, there's a lot. Yeah, and some of these, when you get them, they come with extra set screws, okay? Um, in case you are gonna lose them. So what I do right away, and I deal with a lot of high school students, okay? Is, I, is, is if I'm the, the teacher and I'm doing this, I take out all the gears and put all the set screws in ahead of time, and then I put them back in, all right? That way I know they were there because I know the way people are, it's like Christmas when they open stuff, all right? They just pull it out and all of a sudden this little bag of set screws go somewhere uh, and you don't have them. So you're gonna have to make sure that you've got your gear and you're gonna put your set screw in your gear and get James to hold that up there and you're ready to go, okay? All right. The last thing that we need uh, in order to just put the motor mount together is we need some um, M3 by 10 millimeter button head screws, okay? So you wanna find your M3 by 10 millimeter button head screws is what you wanna do, okay? And this will begin that whole uh, assembly when we are gonna do it. And there'll be a couple of little, uh, little tips and tricks that you can see as you go forward. So I'm gonna go back here and share my screen again. All right, so this is essentially what we are gonna to put together here. All right, if I rotate this around and let you have a look at it. Okay, we're just gonna take the motor. We're going to put the motor mount plate on and we're gonna line up these six button head cap screws, all right? Uh, in my picture right here, I've only got the first four turned on just so that you can see it, all right? If you look at the motor mount, there's going to be uh, two holes in the top of the motor mount, all right? Okay, right here, okay? 
these are what are going to go to the top of the DC motor. And when I mean the top of the DC motor for you, it's probably going to be as close to the one as having the, the red wire up. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. All right. You're going to use six button headed cap screws to put this together. And what you're going to do is you're not going to tighten them. So just give me a second and I'll, I'll show you the whole assembly as we go in. Thank you. I know I'm getting it ready. All right. And we'll go, uh, we'll go from there. So we get those parts together and I'll just stop sharing the screen. All right, and we'll be back. Whoop, didn't stop share. There we go, okay. So a couple of things when you get everything together. So like I said, with the motor, I said probably for you, the, the, the voltage, the red wire would be closer to the top of the motor, okay. And we're gonna put this under the big camera in a minute. You wanna get that motor mount ready for the face. You're gonna use the six button headed cap screws. And when you put these all together, what you wanna do, like anything that I say, is at this point in time, we just wanna get them spun in, but don't tighten them all up, all right? So you wanna leave these a little bit loose and not tightened up. I'm just gonna make sure the miner loosened off on this assembly. Right, because you want to give that a little bit of play, okay, in case they just don't quite line up right. So if you just want to switch over, we'll just show them how we got that with a play. All right, so, and then what we want to do with this is when we go to tighten it, if you remember from my last session, we, we talked about, um, tightening the corners first, okay? So that we don't get any undue portion on here. So what James is gonna do is he's gonna tighten the one corner and he's gonna go to the opposite corner, okay? And he's gonna go back over and he's gonna go back over and he's just gonna tighten up all six, all right? Just to make sure that everything is all uh, lined up with that, okay? All right? And if you look at that uh, from your assembly standpoint, okay, with that, if we take a look at the motor, you're gonna have, like I said, the two holes on the side, you can see them there, are gonna be at the top of the motor, right? So that you can mount that then uh, inside of the channel, right? The next thing to do with this would be to take your 13 tooth bevel gear, I might as well just hand it to James, all right? And he's gonna slide that 13 tooth bevel gear on there. He's gonna put it um, roughly out of position because remember later on, we're gonna to have to adjust and, uh, and mesh the gears. Uh, uh, note that the bevel gear is a D shaft. So it only goes on one way. Yeah. So the D shaft will slide on the D shaft of the motor. Okay. Should be a pretty good tolerance that's gonna to be on there. So he's gonna slide that onto the motor. It's probably gonna give that about what, a four millimeter, three millimeter gap? About, yeah. Yeah, about a three to four millimeter gap, okay? And then he's just gonna lightly tighten the one set. There's two set screws on that, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. One for the flat and then one for the flat. One for the flat and one for the round. And like I said, we may need to get access to these later so that we can do a little bit of adjustment. Uh, but from trial and error, we figure about three or four millimeters works well, okay, when you are going to do the assembly. Put the bevel gear on. All right. Okay. So that's it. So that's good to go. We've got our, uh, our motor assembly done. Like I said, we break everything down, um, individual assemblies. So you should be good to go if you guys can get that all assembled. So I'll give everybody uh, a few minutes to get all caught up. Okay, and then we'll be ready to go. Alright, we'll just give you a couple of seconds to, to look at All right. 
switch back over. Go live. All right. So the next thing that we've decided to do um, on our slide and the way that we decided to assemble it was we're going to put the linear slide and we're going to mount that linear slide. Uh, okay. And we're going to mount that onto our 336U channel. All right. What are you trying to do? I'm going to lower it because I can't see what you guys are doing. We put it over here. I mean, you can't see anything over there. We don't need to see anything. It's over here. Take the, uh, the linear slide out. Now, your linear slides that you get in your package, they're going to come in a 250 millimeter length. Okay? So they're going to look... Uh, like this, there's a one 250 millimeter piece. We're just going to flip over. This one's the new version. Okay. So your version should have red end stops. This one just has a clear end stop. So if we hold up the one that you should have, it'll look like this. And we'll have a nice slide. Right. Okay. Now, just a couple things about the linear slides uh, to talk about them is some of them stay uh, inside of packaging uh, for a little bit. So when they stay inside of packaging, when you see them, all right, uh, as you slide that linear slide, you may feel it to be a little bit rough, all right? So what happens with these sometimes is the packing grease gets jammed up inside of the, inside of the bearings that are inside the slide mechanism, okay? That's mounted onto the rail. So what you wanna do with these is you wanna clean them out. You can do that with any um, grease-based solvent. All right, I'm um, just gonna squirt it in there so that it gets the, the sticky grease um, out from the balls if you find that they're like that. And, and some are, are gonna slide a little bit different um, as you go through and work on it, okay? Uh, once you do that, then what you wanna do is you wanna re-grease your linear slide, all right? So you can use a regular oil on that if you want. Uh, I use something called Way Lube 68, which is specific lube for ways, okay? It's a little bit thicker. Uh, but you're just going to have to make sure that your slides can get properly greased. You know, you're not going to put that much pressure on these. We're not lifting a lot of weight. Uh, so it's not really that much of a super big deal. I would suggest that the end pieces here and this one, as James said, had the clear ones on. What you want to make sure is that if you're going to remove these, you want to put them back in. Or if you do remove them, take a socket headed cap screw. So I'm going to take a socket headed cap screw. I'm going to put it on the end. All right. And then thread a nut. Okay. On to the end of this for now. And the reason is, is that this slide cannot come off the rail mount. If this slide comes off the end of that rail mount, you are going to have very, very small ball bearings all over your table and your floor, and the slide is then uh, no good, all right? So you got to be very, very careful because we pre-mount these, okay, onto the slide mechanism before they're shipped to you, and that's why those end caps are there. So you may have either the, the red end caps like James showed. We'll switch back over, all right? And that's to keep that slide mechanism from coming off the slide. And this is what I did with this one to keep it, was I put a an M3 by 10 in there and I just put a cap nut on the end of it, okay? So I've still got the gap in there, but if I pull that little clear plastic tab out, because maybe I wanna use that mounting hole, I wanna make sure that slide does not come off. And do not trust yourself because you'll think that you're gonna mount this and it's not gonna come off the end with a hard stop and you'll move it like this and it'll slide right off the end, okay? So this can be a real, a real problem when you're gonna work through it, all right? So what we are gonna do is we're gonna use, um, these are tens or twelves? Which one? That we put in here, Ten. these are tens. We're gonna use four M3 by 10 and we'll show you a better picture in a second and as we talked about before in our session, in your kit, you have both kept nuts, okay, and you have nylock nuts, all right? And remember that I said before that we use our nylock nuts for final assembly when we don't need to quickly reassemble 
or disassemble anything because those nuts have that nylon on them that locks on the thread. But if you're prototyping and you know you're going to assemble and disassemble, you want to use your kept nut. So for those of you that have it, opened your packages, your kept nut is the one that has the little grip on it, okay? That's like a little mini washer that bites into the aluminum channel, all right, to give it some grip. But these are also easy for you to put things together, right? As opposed to the nylock. All right, so there's your nylock, which has the built-in nylon on the thread, which uh, locks up the thread a little bit tighter, right? Thing about nylock nuts is they can be used maybe three or four times, okay? And then they're, they're no good anymore because they'll just spin back off. So I've got my piece of, uh, of 336 channel here, all right? And what we're gonna do with that 336 channel is we're gonna mount the, the slide to one end of it. Uh, when you do that, the top hole at the top of this, okay, and I'll get him to show this again in a minute, we're going to mount the slide up the center so that it's about halfway between that top hole. Okay. So we're going to take that top hole and it's going to be right in the center of that top hole. We're gonna come down four and five holes and we're gonna use our, uh, our socket headed cap screws and our, and our cap screws on the inside of it. We're gonna put two in here, all right? And then down at the bottom side, all right? We are gonna put uh, two more, all right? Just to hold them in. And they're gonna go into the slots that are there uh, on the channel, okay? There's no hole for them, and the reason is so that you can have a little bit of play um, and slide mechanisms when you're going to do that, all right? So I'll give you a chance to, to, uh, to put that slide on, all right? I'm going to do mine, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll put it back on the other camera. Just remember that you're going to line it up on the top of the 336 channel. We've gone down five holes, and we're going to put two screws in. And then on the bottom ones, we actually go uh, one hole up and two holes up, all right? And we're going to leave that a little bit loose. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give it some play and, and slide that. So I'm going to do mine. I'm going to put four in, all right? I'm just going to take this one off and put another one on, all right? And just don't over torque. That's what we tell people. So I'll do mine. So I'm going to pass this over to James and I'm going to get him to do it. Um, the one that we've got on here, we've already mounted an inside U-bracket to, uh, just because we were playing around. So I'm going to give James, how many more do you need? Three more screws. One. Whoops. And we'll get this mounted up for you. It's just going to rough, uh, rough align that up on there so that you can see it. It's going to go right down the center of the channel. <coughs> All right. He's got better fingers for this than me because I got great big bubbly fingers. So it makes it easier. As we said with anything, when mounting channel, when mounting slide, he's not going to tighten down the first one. He's just going to put the first one in. All right, he's then going to add a second or third one just to get it roughly held in place. And if we were, you know, super worried about tolerance, we may uh, make a jig 
so that we can make sure it's right in the center. Okay, I can put a square on it to make sure it's in the center. Um, but it's going to line up pretty good for our purposes. We should be okay. Right. So he's got a couple on there. And once he's got that on there, he can tighten that up. Now, the nice thing about a kept nut is that if you are just prototyping, he can put his finger on the kept nut and the one he can use is he can use his uh, socket driver and he can get it fairly snug before he actually goes to the wrench. Right. And as I said, we are prototyping. We don't want to over tighten right now. We're just trying to test the mechanism to see that everything's going to work. Um, we're going to mount that linear slide, okay, and we're just going to roughly mount that on our seat. All right, so we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to get that, uh, get that mounted up. Just like We're taking ours apart and uh, and reassembling it as we go here, um, just to show you the different things that we uh, we're going to do with it. Okay, and you don't have to assemble it this way. This is just the way that uh, that we sat down and decided that we would uh, we would put everything together. So you've got that far. Um, the next thing that you want to find is you're going to find yourself um, four more of the uh, the M10 or M3 by 10 socket head and cap screws and four more cap nut, right? And what you want to do is you want to find yourself an inside view bracket, right? So you're going to have um, your 48 millimeter U channel, and I'll I'll put this over in a minute. And then you'll have an inside U bracket that fits inside of that channel. So I can even actually hold that up a little closer for you so that you can see that on the outside of this, I have the 48 millimeter U channel. And on the inside of it, okay, that slides inside, I have the inside U, okay? So we wanna find one of those um, inside U brackets. So that's a 76086. All right, and what James is going to do when he finds that is we're going to take that inside U and we're going to mount it to the end of the channel. All right, and what he's going to mount that to is he's going to mount that to the end of the channel that has the larger gap. Okay. So if you take a look at the way that we mounted the linear slide where we have that full hole pattern, okay? That's where we're gonna take this inside U because we're gonna do is build a little frame with it. So we're gonna take that inside U and we are going to slide that and mount that inside, all right? So we're just gonna form a little assembly here uh, for our uh, system, okay? That we can put together. We'll show you this whole um, picture up in a little bit of a section. What I'm going to do is I'll go back to the 3D PDF for you. And I'll share my screen just to give you another quick look at it.
So at this point in time, what we're actually doing, okay, is we're going to set up for where we've mounted the motor here. This U channel right here. So this is that inside U, okay? We are going to eventually mount the motor and everything here. And all James is doing right now is mounting that inside U inside, okay? And then he's going to attach it with four M3 by 10 socket and cap screws and four uh, cap nuts. And the reason we use the inside U is to create a stabilization for the shaft. Right. Yes, because eventually we're going to put that motor shaft um, in here, okay, so that we can see what's going to happen. So it's just going to come right in, and you'll see it's mounted on the top two holes, okay, right at the end of the channel there. Okay. So that's your inside U bracket. Okay. So before I start assemble the shaft. We take the other bevel gear, which is the 26 tooth, and we're gonna attach a shaft adapter on the back. We're gonna use four M3 by 10 button heads to here. There are four tapped holes on the shaft, and we're gonna use those so we don't have to use cap nuts or nylock on the others. So right now we're, we're gonna get to the next assembly and James has the parts here. So the first thing that we need to find is we need to find um, the six millimeter shaft hub. They come in a four pack, right? Uh, that's part number seven six two eight four. So you want to find one of those uh, one of those shaft hubs, okay? So like I said, they come in a pack of four. All right, there's one right there. We want to we want to pull one of those out. Same thing with these. Um, remember that they're going to have set screws, okay? And you don't want to lose those uh, little bags of set screws because once you do that, um, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So two set screws in each one. You're then going to find your 26 tooth bevel gear, all right? And you should have those. They also, I believe, come in a pack of two, all right? Um, that you're going to have. So you need that a 26 tooth bevel gear. And I do apologize, but I just noticed unless I have a different version of it, um, I forgot to put that on the parts list. Okay, so you do need to find that 26 tooth bevel gear and you're gonna use the uh, button head screws to mount the shaft hub to the bell gear. Same thing here, when you're gonna mount that, do not put one on and tighten it up, okay? Because, you know, there's little tolerances in there. So thread them in, keep them loose, so that you can have a little bit of play um, before you mount everything together, right? So that you can see it. He's gonna do that um, on that assembly as we go forward. At the same time, what he's got here is he's gone and he's found some, uh, some flange bearings, okay? So he's found the flange bearing, the six millimeter ID, 14 millimeter OD flange bearings. He's gone and got those, he's got two flange bearings out. So those are part number 76302. So you want to find your flange bearings. He's found himself some one millimeter spacers. Right? So he's gotten the uh, the one millimeter spacers out. So you want to find your one your one millimeter spacers, okay? Uh, which is great. So that's 76305. He then has a pulley. So he's grabbed himself uh, one of the six millimeter timing pullings because it had two. These come in a two pack. So seven, six, two, three, two. And he's already put his set screw in his pulley. Right? So he's got that. He's grabbed one of the six millimeter by 96 millimeter shafts. Okay. And he's grabbed himself one, in this case, shaft collar. All right. So that's the 76304, all right, shaft collar. So we're gonna build a little um, mini assembly out of this um, to mesh the two bevel gears together um, with the motor when we put the motor mount in on this. Right. So I'll let you get all these parts together. So if you look at it, we've got the hub, all right? So we've got one six millimeter shaft hub. We have the 26 tooth bevel gear, we've mounted that. 
with the button heads, okay? We have two flange bearings, three spacers, one millimeter spacer, one shaft collar, and one 10 millimeter, or one uh, uh, timing cord, okay? That we've got there. So 10 to six millimeter timing cord. All right, so get that stuff together and then we'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, show him putting it together and then we'll talk about it and then we'll show it again, all right? So just give yourself a few minutes to get all those parts. You didn't do a jig for me last time, did you? This thing. Okay, so first what we're gonna do is there are two holes here. So one on the main channel, then one on the back of the inside U channel. We're gonna place the two flange bearings. We're gonna work on a pressure system here. So just gonna move the motor out of the way. So instead of placing the flange on the outside, we're actually gonna place the flange on the inside of the channel like that, and then another one like this. Due to tolerances, they might pop out easy, as you can see with this one. So you might have to work with that and hold it in place in certain angles to make sure they don't pop out while you're inserting. Or use chewing gum. No. No, no, no. chewing gum? Right, okay. So if we look at the actual I'm gonna show model you. Yeah. here, we can see that you have the two bearings on the inside. On the outside here, on the inside U channel, we have the bearing, then a spacer, then the collar. And then on this side, we have a bearing, and then you might not be able to see it, but there's a spacer there. And then we have the bevel gear. And then on the outside, we have the pulley. And then there's a small spacer on the inside there too. The reason we put the spacers there in between the bearings is to allow for a more smoother operation on the shaft. If there was no spacer, it wouldn't be that smooth and it would tighten up and your system would not be that good. So let's assemble it now using the model here. Right, so I'm just gonna share my screen again so that you can see it from a different view and a different uh different picture. All right, so this is what we're gonna do um, with the assembly. So as James said, he's got that inside U channel mounted, all right? And he's just gonna to put together this section of the assembly here. So you can see it here, there's the flange bearing the shaft, okay? And if I do look right there, right in here, you can see Okay, where the spacers go. So there's a spacer right there. There's a spacer right there, all right? So basically the easy way to put it is if I've got metal to metal, all right? I wanna put a spacer there because I do not want that metal to metal friction, okay, tighten it up. We want a nice smooth mechanism. You shouldn't hear anything um, when it rotates, okay? And on the other side, it's the same thing, okay? If I look at it right in here, okay, there's the, the shaft collar, okay. Took the set screw out of here so that you can see where the set screw mounts on the D flat and did not insert the set screws in the diagram, all right. And then of course there is a spacer, okay, inside of here uh, as well. So if you look at that. So we're just gonna build this assembly and put it together. This are, these are the tricky ones if you got big fingers when you're gonna do it. Um, so you should be able to just get that together and have a quick look at it. So we'll finish our assembly and we'll let you finish your assembly um, in real time.
Let's stop here. I am going to stop here. Okay. James decided to do this because I am terrible at this. My fingers and the bearings go everywhere. It's just terrible. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to attach the uh, pulley to the shaft. I'm going to make sure that the uh, shaft is flush with the end of the pulley. And then I also want to make sure that the flat of the shaft lines up with the set screw. And then I'm just going to tighten it in. Pull it out. And you'll see that now the pulley is attached to the set screw and on the shaft and it won't move. I'm gonna insert the spacer like so. And then I can push the spacer into one of the bearings into the front here, not the inside U channel. I want to insert it into the actual channel. like so. Then I'm going to add a spacer on the inside of the shaft. So this can get a bit difficult. There we go. And then I'm going to add the bevel gear. You want to try and line up one of the set screws on the bevel gear with the flat of the shaft so that you can screw it in properly. I'm going to insert that. And the set screws are too far forward, so I have to take them out a bit. Okay. And then you don't have to screw in the, this right away because it'll make it harder to put the collar in at the end. Right. So you want to leave a little bit. You want to. Remember we said, don't tighten everything up because you got to put the collar in um, and then you're going to have to mesh your bevel gear. Next thing is we're going to add the collar. Remember the collar is already a D-shaft, so it should make it easier to go on. I'm going to slide it on. Then I'm also going to slide on a spacer. I'm going to slide it through the bearing at the end. Now everything should be somewhat attached. Close the bearing, see? Yeah. Once it's on, I'm not really that particular. So I'm gonna now set the bevel gear as tight as I can. Make sure that at least one of the set screws are on the D-shaft, as you can see here. I have this set screw and this set screw lined up and you can see the flat of the Disha. So I'm gonna just tighten that up. And I'm gonna find the other set screw, tighten that. And now what I can do is rotate to the other side, make sure that bearing is in, slide the collar and Spacer over, like so. And now he'll tighten that one up. And voila, we have a finished. And now you can see it's a bit loose. So what I want to do now is I have to go in and retighten everything so that it's not loose like this. You don't want this. This is play. Play will result in a bad elevator. So I'll let Derek start talking about the other part and I will tighten this up so it's more clean. Can we give you this part? Next? No. Okay, 
put out. Gonna take that apart, and we're gonna make sure we'll do that next. Okay. All right. So we we decide here as we go through, we we change a couple of things. He's gonna tighten that up. All right. Um, we're gonna have to do a couple of uh, a couple of other assemblies uh, as we get going. Um, so in preparation for that. Uh, what we want to do uh, on our slide is on the, the other end, we're actually going to build a little assembly that uh, almost looks the same. Okay, so you're going to need the same parts. So for the future right now, well, James is tightening that one up. Uh, what we want to do is we want you to get together um, another inside bracket and a 48, mil and a 48 millimeter U channel. Okay, so an outer and an inny, as we say. Okay. Uh, you're going to find your other shaft, right? Your other 96 millimeter, um, six millimeter D shaft. You will find two more flange bearings. Get those ready. Get those set aside. One more pulley. So you want to get your, your extra pulley set aside. And of course, in this case, we're going to need two spacers as well. Um, so get that apart. We'll disassemble this in a minute uh, because we're going to build this as we go forward. Right. Okay. So I've now tightened this. There's no more play. I won't push back and forth, but it is still very smooth in operation. Okay, you want to do the limit switches next? Yeah, well, the one limit switch we can do. We can do one limit switch and we'll talk about it. Okay. Um, so, what we've done on, on the, the slide that, that we've actually built here, which is a a few ways that you can control movement on the fly. All right. So we are going to show you in the coding how to use the encoder counts on the motor. Okay. To know where the positioning is um, with the slide if you want. But in this case, what we've decided to do is we've actually taken our limit switches. Okay. And, and mounted them on. So at this point in time, we're going to, if you can get your, uh, your limit switches together, and we'll talk about this because you may not have the capabilities right now to do the wiring um, for these limit switches, but we're just going to show you how we put them on and we're going to talk about them. Okay. So if you don't get to the limit switch part right now, um, do not uh, worry about that too much. All right. One limit switch mounts um, right on the channel at the top. The other limit switch, we're just going to have to wait because that other assembly that I told you to get ready. Okay. It has to mount on here first with a 96 millimeter plate, and then the limit switch goes on top. And that's just because that's where we decided to put the limit switch um, on the whole slide mechanism that was going forward. Right? So you get four limit switches, I believe, right? Inside of, of your collection. They will come um, with the spade connectors that you can you can wire and use. All right. And what we actually did for ours was we just took one of our included PWM cables because we know that uh, one side of it we're going to plug into the uh, to the VMX or, or into the Titan, sorry, into the limit switch input on the Titan. All right, um, and on the other side, what we had done was we just cut that wire off. Is what we did. We just decided to use these wires because we had a bunch of them. And we're going to put the spade connectors on, okay, to the limit switches. So James will put that on the uh, on the other side. Yes. Yeah, so here you can see the limit switch, which is mounted to the channel, and then included with the limit switch are the connectors. And all we did was we took that cable, stripped it, added it to the connectors with the crimp and they slide right on. Now we didn't put a uh, shrink tube over this. However, you probably should as you don't want just in case they touch the channel as it's metal, it will conduct it and you don't want that. Right. Okay. So we're building a bunch of, uh, of online materials for you. And one of the things in there uh, is called electrical. So there's a, there's a section on mechanical that just talks about how to build things in mechanical. And there's a section on electrical. Um, one of the things we're doing in the electrical is we are going to give you um, wiring tips and tricks. So we're going to talk about uh, different tools you can use, um, shrink wrapping, okay, grounding issues, 
uh, and so on for each one of those. So like I said, all we did to make this simple was we grabbed those, those PWM cables from the cable kit that comes with it. We had cut off one of the ends and stripped it and we used the spade connectors. We happen to have a wonderful, fine, fancy crimper, okay, for doing um, these particular types of connectors here. Um, best 25 US dollars we ever spent, I think. Uh, but you can use a pair of pliers, you can use an old fashioned crimper um, to put those on. As James said, the thing is, you wanna make sure these connections are good, okay? Because rule number one in robotics is the majority of, of issues that you have are from faults in wiring, okay? Shorts um, and grounding faults, okay? All right, you want that back? We got another limit switch. Okay, so we'll we'll um, we'll grab another limit switch. Okay, and if he's getting that, I'll just talk about a few other things. Now, well, I've got you here. There's a, a couple of other things that uh, that you can do and you can keep aside. All right, and this is what I this is one of the little kits that I uh, I have put together. Okay, remember that when you get to competition, you are allowed to bring your toolbox with you. All right. Um, with certain things. We also will bring items to the competition for you to use, okay, as part of the, um, the shared workspace, the shared tool space. So, I mean, as an example, I always, I always have one of these with me. Uh, we got earplugs in here for safety. So, you know, what this is for me is when I do any wire connections, I put ferrule connectors on everything. So I have a, a ferrule wiring kit here. Right, and the ferrules are simply the little round connectors. So we'll just take a little bit of time here and we'll talk about, uh, about wiring, right? So these are the type of connectors and I'm just gonna switch over to the other camera here, right? So we can see it. So we'll, we'll use this ferrule connector and any wires that we're gonna put into screw terminals, right? We're gonna crimp a ferrule on here. And then we're going to shrink wrap that. So, you know, these are the little types of things that we want to make sure so that our wiring is good so that we don't get any frayed wiring or so on. So I just wanted to show you that. And as I said, when we do the electrical sections um, of this, we're going to talk about different crimping, different types. We'll talk about power poles uh, and everything else for you as a mechanism. Okay. All right. Do it. The wire. Oh, you got one. That one. The monster. Yeah. So we're gonna do a limit switch. Why not? Yeah. So in the pack of limit switches, there are four plus a bunch of connectors. So included in the collection is two pair, well, there's a couple of these uh, servo three pin cables with a female to female end. I'm gonna cut one of the ends off. This will then separate the wires. I'm gonna pull the wires out a part of it. So it makes it easier to connect the connectors. Now this is a 22 gauge wire, but these uh, connectors are not for 22 gauge. So we need to strip a bit more off the cable and do a fold. Of course, you can also switch to a 22 gauge crimp if you needed to. I'm just gonna strip off all the ends. Then 
then what I'm going to do is twist and pull. Twisting in. This will give me the thicker wire so that it works better inside the crimp. I feel like a doctor handing James tools or a nurse, not a doctor, an assistant. All right, and then I'm going to take the crimper. Crimper's got its gauges. I'm using a blue crimp, so I'll go into the blue section. Color coded for Derek. Stick the cable in. Fill the crimp. And I have a good connection. Do the same for the rest. Okay. A little blue. Oh, that was not a good connection. Oops. Yeah, it, it's because we're going from the 22 gauge, like I said, to the not 22 gauge crimp. So. And that's just because that's what wire we decided we would. Yeah. You know. Use. We don't actually need the red cable, so I'm going to cut it. To the As the middle pin's not connected on the tight end limit switch, I'm going to cut it. We're going to use this one. I'm going to fold it over an extra time just to make it that much thicker. It's, it's interesting talking about wire gauges because, you know, I thought it was only people that did wiring that had to understand wiring gauges. And then on the, on the weekend, my wife was watching a video on uh, on making jewelry. And uh, boy, they were going on a 16 gauge and 22 gauge. And so if wire. you look at the limit switch, it's a single pull double throw. So you have your common pin, which you're going to connect to the black cable and then you have the two signal pins that you're going to connect to the white cable so you can choose either to do the normally open or the normally closed i recommend to use the normally open so black to the common pin which is the bottom one just going to slide that right on and then the normally open one is the pin right here there is a diagram on the top here to allow for a better understanding. And then if you want to pass the trainer. So now I'm going to show, we won't do this now, but on the Titan, there are limit switch inputs for each motor. So there's a high and a low. So you would plug the, the other end of the cab cable directly into the Titan. You can see there's a pin out here on each side in the middle to show you where, which way is which way. We want the black cable to ground and the white cable to signal. So I'm gonna plug it into, let's go with the lower limit switch here. Just like that. So now what will happen is that when I, when this gets hit, it'll trigger an interrupt inside the Titan, which will tell the Titan not to move the motor in that direction, which means you don't have to do any coding yourself. It's all done for you. And that's what makes it so nice. Just gonna take this out. So here on this one, when this is plugged into the Titan, when this is moving, if it passes your uh, encoder count by accident, your PID is not calibrated properly, or something happens and hits that limit switch, it'll kill the motor in that direction.
but it'll still allow you to move the motor in the other direction. And as that's plugged into the Titan, there will be no programming required, and it makes it a lot simpler for when you're doing a elevator lift mechanism. All right, so just a little talk about the limit switches. Like we said, you may um, you may not get them on to your, uh, what we're gonna just show you, because uh, you may not have them wired up or anything, but they're on the diagram there. We just want to talk about the inputs and how they work uh, for you and, and so on going forward on the elevator. Okay, we are gonna put this limit switch on first though okay. before we move on. Uh, your second channel up. Okay. So as the belt is on this side, and this is the upper limit switch, I wanna make sure that the limit switch is in the proper location. Because if I flip the limit switch over, you'll see that it's not really in the good location and that the contactors are facing towards the area of motion, which is never good because that means the cables are gonna get tied up. So I'm gonna flip the limit switch over. Cables are now facing away from the area of motion and the roller contact is closer to the area of motion, which allows for better center. So I'm gonna put the screw first through going to use this hole right here, this hole right here. Yeah. Uh, well, you put it in the- Yeah, I'm in the slot. Put it in the slot, yeah. So I'm using the uh, M3 by 20 millimeter screws here. There should be a pack included inside the kit for that. Going to slide it through the Limit switch hole here. I'm gonna put the nut on this end. I'll explain why I put the nuts on this end a bit later. All right. Now I'm going to, as that one's now set, I'm gonna slide the screw until where I can find I can slide the other screw through, which happens to be in another slot area. So if I move it, it'd be this slot right here. And that's why we have slots in the channel, is to allow for you to slide stuff around and find a good mounting orientation. I'm just gonna loosely tighten with my hands to make sure that it's Got a good connection before I tighten all the way down. Right. And now I'm going to screw it down using the screwdriver. Now the reason we put the screws on the inside of the channel, well the head on the inside of the channel, is that when we put the motor inside, the motor is here and there's very little clearance inside the channel when the motor is inside here. So if we had the other way around, we'd have this little bit of extra screw plus the nut that'd be poking through on this side of the channel. However, with the socket head on this side, it's not gonna cause an issue when we put the motor. And we're actually going to put the motor in now before moving on. All right. So we're taking the. I'm just going to hand James the uh, the very first thing we did today, which was that small motor assembly. All right. So the motor assembly is there. Um, it's on the motor mount. It's got the 13 tooth bevel gear attached to it. All right. He is going to grab his button head. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to use the button heads on here. And we're going to mount that motor um, into that to, into that assembly so that you can see it. So I'm just going to share my screen for a minute so that you can see where we're at, okay, uh, on the other assembly, and let him uh, get prepared for that. Okay. So you can see right here is is we have the uh, the limit switch mounted on. You may have to jiggle that left and right. Okay, um, we stuck them on there. You'll notice we did not put the screws through 
um, on the assembly diagram, and that's just because of the way that you're going to mount that limit switch. Now, we decided that we would build this um, because we're just prototyping um, complete. We're only using components that are included um, in the collection to do this. Um, you may, in the past, we've shown you that we have 3D printed some little mounts with triggers on them, okay, for the limit switches. But uh, we're not going to use them uh, here. Uh, we're just going to mount the limit switches right to the channel, and this is what we want to do. And you know, afterwards, if we decide that uh, you know, when testing our robot, that maybe something comes loose, you know, we we may need to to look at that and design a little bracket or something. All right. So what he's going to do now, and I'll just change this over to uh, the rotate. Okay. This is actually going to take the motor and mount the motor in. Okay. To do that, he'll slide that motor mount inside the uh, 336 channel, and he'll just use the 12 millimeter button head screws, okay, in order to fasten that in there. All right. Um, he picked button head because it creates a low profile. Right. He wanted a low profile um, on the side down there, okay, um, so that you can see it. So, you know, it's entirely up to you uh, the way that you want. Okay, free. so if we notice there's the two screws at the top here, or two holes at the top, this is going to sit mated with the bottom of the channel here. We're going to aim for the two holes at the top of the pattern right there. That's where these two holes line up with. Okay, there we go. Which are also the two holes right here on the top of the chair. So I'm going to stick it inside. It may be a bit tight, may not be, but don't feel scared to put a little pressure. And because the gears are also there already, you might need to push a little to have the mesh properly. There we go, that's the click showing good mesh. All right. So now before I screw them in, you can see, you can see real clear, the actual holes from the motor mount in those two slots there. I'm gonna screw those ones in first. I'm gonna take the two button heads Gonna do a little finger tight first to thread them. All right, and I'm gonna take my screw set, screw it in. I'm not fully tightening yet. I'm just finger tight. Now on the sides, because it's a motor and there's a lot of torsion stress. We want to create three points of contact on the motor shaft, I mean the motor mount. So we've created one, which is at the top here. And then there's holes here on both sides that we're going to screw into to create that three points of contact to create a good hold of that motor. So I'm going to check four more screws and then screw them in. If you look, you'll easily see the threaded holes inside the channel. So you can see here, there's one in the middle slot hole, and then there's one at this top hole. That's the one side. And now flip over and do the other side.
now that I have all six screws placed, I can now tighten them. I always tighten the top first. And then I'll do one side on this side, one on this, on this side, and then the last one. And now the motor is mounted and it's good. And if we look here, we can see a proper mesh between the two bevel gears. And you will notice you will not be able to turn the pulley here on the shaft. And that's because we have a two to one ratio here on the output shaft, which means we've reduced our speed by 50%, but we've doubled our torque. So there is a lot of torque on this shaft. And it looks very hard for any of us to have that much hand strength to actually turn this. Big guy can't do it, so, you know. And I had Wheaties this morning. Yeah. So we've now completed the uppermost part of the elevator. All right. The other end now. We're trying to keep screws from going all over the table here, uh, which is pretty good. All right. So we got the upper the upper part done in the in the motor mesh. Uh, okay. Uh, so the motor side. So what we're now going to do is we're going to do the other side, I believe, correct, James? Yeah. Okay. And that's with those other component parts um, that I had told you that you wanted to get together. So we're going to lengthen this out a little bit by adding a 48 millimeter um, channel to the outside as well. And, and the reason we need that is if we look at the channel, if you notice something, you have the pulley here, but on this side, you can't put a pulley at the slide mechanism is actually hogging the last hole here. And as the 336 is the longest channel we provide in the kit, we add this extra block here at the end to create that hole for us to add the eye to it. Right. So what we do is, is we, we do the assembly and we're gonna use some um, uh, 96 by 40 flats. So there's a flat. Right, and what we'll do? Uh, do you build the assembly first, and then just put the flat no. on, or you're doing it the other way? We well, did the right. Same thing. Right. So I'm just going to pull this one apart, and we'll just show you what we're going to do, uh, and then I'll show you on the diagram, um, and we'll let you do that. I think I only brought one extra. That's the other flat. Oh, there it is. Now remember, we're not by no means saying that this is the best way to do this. This was just one that, uh, you know, we were sitting and talking and, and we came up with an idea to be able to do this. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is we are going to um, transition over to the, to the other side here. So we're just gonna, Use my navigation tools in my 3D PDF. All right, I'm going to pan over a little bit. All right, I don't have all the mouse clicks because I have some really weird mouse that nobody likes. Okay, so we're going to use uh, look at the other side of this right now, and that's what James is doing. So at the other end of the 336 channel, we're going to add the, uh, the small assembly and we're going to build it. So he's going to do that um, in stages for you, but he's got a 48 channel that he's going to add to it. To do that, he's going to use the 96 by 40 flats, all right? Notice that he's got opposite points of contact here, okay? Please remember that when he puts it on, he's going to finger tight, and then he's going to tighten from opposite corner to opposite corner. So here to here and here to here, okay? So that we don't get any torsion when we're uh, assembling any of the channels together, all right? And then he's going to work at this, and you're going to see that we're just going to basically build another, okay, small assembly to house the other axle, all right, down at the bottom of this. So if you look at it, there's the shaft, 
Uh, and in this case, the flange bearings are going to go the on the opposite. Outside. So they're going to go from the outside. But no, take note as well, right there, I can see it. It's in the diagram. Okay, there is my little spacer um, that's put onto that shaft, you know, to separate the shaft collar uh, from the flange bearings as it goes through. So we're just going to go uh, and assemble the other side of this, all right? And then we'll almost have a complete mechanism. All right, I will stop sharing. Yeah. So before we place this on the channel, we're going to add the 96 flats to the bottom here first. So we actually need the 48 channel, the inside U channel, the two of these, and we're going to use M12 screws as we're going to be going through three pieces of the channel at once, well, which is about nine millimeters. So if you use the M10 or the M8 screws that are included, it won't work as you will not be able to make contact with the nut. So first things first is you take the inside U channel and the 48 channel and you're just gonna stick it in, boom. And you're gonna try and line up the holes the best you can. I like to go by the center hole. That's a good way to line them up. And it's pretty good lined up for me. All right. And then I'm going to take one of the flats here, line it up as well. Take a screw, put it through one of the holes. As you can see, I have a screw thread on the other side there. I'm going to take a cap nut. I'm just going to loosely finger tighten this. And do one on the other side here. This can get a bit tight by the quarters. Loosely tighten this one. It makes it easier if you can keep all your stuff um, organized. So just so you know what we do here is for our assembly piece, we, we keep everything in big bin for our hands. So you wanna make sure you got ready access to everything so you're not trying to dump stuff out of bags and so on, all right? Um, you can put that into a small plastic bin if you were, uh, if you were traveling as well. So hint, hint, you know, uh, when you set your toolbox up, for the World Skills Competition, I would probably, in my checklist, put a few extra factors in there. So even though they'll be provided to you when you get there, it's nice not to have to go over and get them if you got some right there ready to go at your workstation. So now that we're done on the one side, we have to add the other side. And same thing as before, we're gonna use four screws. That's the recommended Rule of thumb.
that's not a 12 screw. So just to show you, this was not a uh, 12 millimeter screw. And as you can see, you can't see that screw at all on the other side. So it's not passing through all the channel. So right now we could take this and take the actual channel and then slide it on and screw it in. But before we do that, it might be easier to add the pulley system first. Right. And before we do that, um, it's 830. So let's give everybody. OK, we're going to attach it and then we'll give everybody a break. James is ready to go here. Yeah. So as before, we have a pulley that is attached to the shaft that is flush on one end. We're gonna add a one millimeter spacer. Be sure not to put the shaft through the holes where the screws are. You want the shaft to be through the holes where the 48 channel is and where the inside U channel is. The pulley goes on the side where the 48 channel is. So I'm going to put the bearing in, stick this through. And then going to take the other bearing, stick it on, stick it through the inside U channel. Going to place a, another one millimeter spacer. Then I have the shaft collar. And I'm going to tighten the shaft collar on the shaft. All right. And now we can see that the, there's no play, so it's pretty good. And it still sp spins super smooth. Now we, going, now we want to attach the main body assembly to the bottom here to allow for the shaft to line up. So what you want to do here is you want to try and get the 48 channel as in line and flush as you can to the main body channel, so the 336 channel. So to do that, it might require some loosening of these screws and some retightening of these screws to line up. And that's why you always, as Derek says, keep the screws loose until you're got everything good and then you can use a square or a jig to make sure everything is lined up correct. So I'm going to screw these in. You can screw it in as well. Yeah. And we're going to take our break. We'll take a 10 minute break. And as, as James said, we could use a jig, um, but James has laser eyes. So he can tell me that that's perfectly within tolerance um, anytime. So we'll take a, a break. We'll see everybody back, I guess, around uh, 840. Um, and we'll continue on, uh, finish off the mechanism and talk about a few things. Uh, and then we'll look at how we would set this up in a project um, and how we would code that to finish off. All right.
excited, but oh, James wants to come back early because he's so excited. All right. Okay. So we're just gonna uh, f finish off the uh, the mechanism uh, right now. Then we're gonna have a talk about a few things, uh, and we're probably just gonna skip to the very end of the mechanism and let you uh, do the really hard part. No, and uh, and figure it out on your own uh going forward so that you can see it um this also gives us a good time frame because you can see that if we go through this slow by slow by slow step by step with you um how long each session can take so when i build a whole base robot um well actually a base robot's probably easier to build than this so that, that's fine but it gives us a good time for the time frame so we'll just finish off this uh, this mechanism uh and then we'll get into the coding section of it Okay, so as you can see, the bottom shaft is now, uh, bottom section is now completed. So if we we're to put the belt on now, it connect here and you be able to, but the problem is there's nothing attaching to the belt yet for the slider to be dragged upon. So we need to add in, we're gonna add an inside U channel. Do you have 48 channel? And then after we attach the inside U channel, we're gonna attach an outside 48 channel to, and the 48 channel will attach to whatever your object management system will be or whatever you want to add to it. Right. And now remember that this is a single um, elevator. So a lot of times we do a dual elevator um, I know when we do the full robot, you'll get a dual elevator, so you'll have some additional support. All right, but I want you to remember that that this is just building a mechanism. So the idea behind this is to give you an idea. So um, yes, I understand there can be undue stretches and torsion and so on on the mount, but like I said, our goal here uh, was to just build a quick mechanism just to show you how things mount together uh, when you're gonna go forward. So we are gonna mount that uh, inside U on the uh, linear slide. Okay, we're gonna put it right onto the linear slide. Uh, and you know you wanna be a little bit careful because some of these are, are drilled a little bit different. So you wanna make sure you get a good point of contact. Um, that said, you could make a little mount that you could put onto that linear slide um, because to get them standard, the whole patterns uh, have to be a certain way on the metric when we when we do these with the manufacturer and so on. Uh, you know, otherwise it would cost trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, so we can look at that. So we're going to put that together. Um, James is going to talk a little bit about the trick for what he's going to do so that we can loop the belt around this and how we loop the belt around this. But I'm going to have a little talk about belts in a minute. Okay. So just a couple of things when you're mounting it, we're gonna mount this with the um, socket headed cap screws, okay? The 10 millimeter, uh, 10 millimeter or eight millimeter? Eight. Eight millimeter socket headed cap screws. Um, you can do a bunch of different things with it. I have some six millimeter that have a larger base um, that I may wanna use, okay? We don't put six millimeter in the kit, um, but I always keep extra fasteners with me anyways for design of different types. You may want to put a small lock washer on there, but like I said, right now we're just prototyping. That's all we're doing. So we'll let him go on and, uh, and put that together. So before we attach this to the slide here, I'm going to add an M12, uh, M3 by 12 screw on the two holes right here. These, this will act as the tie point for the belts and allow it to be pulled between both pulleys. And we'll show that on the final one after. So on the slide mechanism, the whole spacing between this hole and this hole is 16 millimeters. And the whole spacing between this hole and this hole is 15 millimeters. Now our channel has the 16 millimeter spacing, but there is no 15 millimeter spacing. So that's why you can make your own little flat bracket if you wanted to, to fit better onto this. But we are gonna use the spacing where there is a 16 millimeter hole spacing. 
and that is between the two slots. So that's this point right here and this point right here. There's a 16 millimeter space. So between, well, these four slots here create a 16 millimeter grid. And we're going to use that. So if I line it up, you can see that they line up. And take the eight millimeter socket head screw. Got it first. And I'm going to loosely screw it in. And I'm going to add the other one. Loosely screw it in. Going to make sure the carriage is straight before I screw it in. And then I'll tighten them. All right. And now it should look like that. Here you can see where it's attached to the channel. I mean the slide, which is this screw and this screw. And then these two screws will act as the belt puller. And you'll see now that I can slide this pretty good between the two points. And it's tight, it's not coming off. And then you can see if I flip over the area where the belt will be slider. All right. Okay. I didn't take over. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about belts. Okay. And the theory for the belt. So I'm going to slide my chair over where James was. And James is going to slide his chair over where I was. All right. Lots of good, lots of good fun here. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, about the belt. So you get a 400 millimeter belt in your in your collection, all right. And the belt, uh, when you get it in your collection, is all looped together. It's it's one piece. So if you've pulled this out and you've tried to put it between channel, you go, hey, wait a minute. Uh, if I had 400 millimeter channel, maybe that would fit. Uh, maybe that wouldn't fit and so on. So this has been a big debate uh, with us. Do we put um, pre-done belts, okay, certain sizes only uh, inside of your kit, okay, because we do this with a lot of robotic stuff um, that we put together. Um, and the thing that we find there is that um, we find that uh, people just end up buying a lot of belts. And, and I don't mind that, but I probably got in the size in the back 30 or 40 different sizes of belt okay so for prototyping and working what you can do with that belt is you can cut it to length okay you can use a belt calculator depending upon the distances that you have to put that together and the question is going to be is is how do you put this together and do it now what james is going to show you that he did um, when he did his belt is he actually took the belt and he's going to loop it around those um, M12 screws on each of the brackets this way, right? And then for him, what he did was he took tie straps and he put three tie straps on there to just hold it together, okay? So that it was temporary. Because remember, we're, we're um, prototyping. This is not a finished robot. If I was going to make a finished real robot for use in industry, then I would get the right belt and put it there. But you know, in world scales, we have to adapt and we have to change uh, all the time, especially going forward, because you got to remember that you may have to change your mechanism based upon a change in the challenge going forward. So you'll notice uh, what James is going to do is that piece, that, that um, socketed cap screw that's sticking out, that's threaded in, he's actually going to loop the belt around it, okay, like this as a holding point, right? And remember it's mounted in the channel and then he's gonna tie strap the extra belt together here to hold that together. And you'll see with our mechanism um, is it goes and it, it doesn't slip at all. 
There's a lot of different ways um, that you can do this. Uh, I had a little bracket here for belt that I had put together. It's the same thing, I looped this around, but instead of using tie straps here, all I've done is used, it's called super new glue, all right? So it's, it's, uh, it's super glue, all right? Uh, this cost me $2.95 Canadian. So in real money, probably 50 cents US. All right, big tube of glue, it's gonna last forever. Um, what I did with this piece of belt here was I was just running a test. I looped it back over so that you can see that there in a couple of sections. Put a little dab of super glue on that. I held that for 20 seconds. And I can tell you right now that I cannot break that, okay, this way. I could probably twist it and try to break it, but we're not putting enough stress on that, okay, um, to be able to control that. I've seen people take this and double it over and they've actually put a little hole in here and, you know, you could put a bolt through that. So you could put a socket head cap screw through that, you could put a cap nut through that and you could hold it that way. You just got to be careful that it's not going to get into the mechanism when you're going to do it. Remember, we're not designing a continuous belt here. We're only going back, back and forth. So the joint is fine. And there's other ways you could bolt that joint, the belt, for instance, right into the U bracket. So you could put a bolt through that and bolt it right into the U bracket. Um, I used glue. In a future session, what I'm gonna do is show you how to put together um, and join a timing belt. This is a long section of timing belt and we, we ripped this one apart last, last night. But just to show you, here I have a small piece of, uh, of fabric. This is a ripstop fabric. So I'm thinking of putting these together for everybody. What would I do with this is this is the same stuff I use if I rip my raincoat and I buy the little patch and I put it on. So it's a very, very tight, strong fabric that's put together. And all I can do with that fabric is I can butt the ends together and I can laminate two pieces. So this is one that we, uh, James actually broke on me because I didn't even actually use any glue on this. I just use it as tape, but you can actually see that as I pull this, it takes a lot to pull that off with just that tape. But what you do with it is I'm gonna cut these flat, put these in a jig, and I'm gonna create a, a video to show you guys how to do this and laminate that over with the glue. And then the fabric tape, when it's cut, we put that over tape with that super glue and we'll actually laminate that together, all right? And that way when it's in the jig, what I'll get is I will get a continuous belt. So I had to create a little video on, uh, on uh, make your own belts, I'm gonna call it, M-Y-O-B. Uh, and we're gonna make that available, you know, in the next month or so for everybody. We're gonna try it a few different ways just so that you can see um, how things can be put together. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the belts um, and how they're gonna go. And we could have prepped this, so I'll show you, we sand that a little bit here and here to get through the coating on the end of the rubber. Um, and then when we laminate that over, um, it works really well. I've seen people do this with ribbon. I've seen people do this with laminated Kevlar, um, but we don't need to get to laminated Kevlar here, not for the weight loads that we're putting on our robots. So just a little tip um, and trick on, on that belt and how you can put those timing belts together. Um, whether it's going to be continuous or whether you're going to do it the way that we did it because it's not uh, not continuous. All right. Slide back out of the way. Okay. So, yeah, that belt. There we go. I'm just gonna show you how we routed the belt on the finished product. So essentially, we're going to first pull it through like this, make sure it makes contact. And as you can see here, it, it doesn't look like it makes sense on how this goes together. So what we're gonna do is, if you see in the hole there, we're gonna slide the belt underneath like that of the screw. You're just gonna push it through. Once it's pushed through a bit, 
you can see that's that's pushed through. It's created the loop. Then gonna place a zip tie there, tie it tight. Place two or three to create a good grip, and then cut off the excess strap uh, belt that's not required. And then we'll do the same on the other side by looping it through, tie in, it'll be tight. So if we look at the final product, you can see there how there's three straps holding it together. As Derek says, this is probably not the most optimal solution. And also, if you also notice the because the carriage is right on the sh slider of the uh, slide. What occurs is if you look at the whole thing, the belt's actually being pinched down where this should be raised up a bit so that the belt can move freely. And again, this was just the prototype to show you guys how to make a lift system. So you can always improve on it, add things, make it better. Some people have 3D printed clamps to be used here. You can use an O-ring if it's uh, if there's properly like strength there. But in general, this just shows the concept. So we're not gonna use the belt on the other one. We're not gonna show you this one. The only difference here is we have the belt attached and then we added the extra 48 channel with the two uh, 96 flat beams to act as a limit switch hitter as the carriage won't actually make contact with the limit switch unless we add these. So when this slides up and down, it'll make contact with the limit switches. Show the spacers there really quick. Oh. So if I look in here, in order to make the height clearance for the limit switch to get a good contact, I use uh, spacers. So on this side, there's the two millimeter spacer. And on this side, there's the five millimeter spacer. I'd probably use the five millimeter spacer for both of them. In the CAD model, there it shows a five millimeter spacer for both of them. So I'm not going to attach this to the training platform to show you how to wire it, and then we will go into programming. Right, so like I said, rather than just keep everything in a in a big mumbo jumbo, okay, on the um, on the table, we use our little training platform that we built um, for everything. Okay, it allows us to test, it allows us to connect things, it allows us to make sure that our our code is okay um, going forward. For you, if you're going to do this today, you're going to need to to um, get these together. So you will need to have your VMX connected to your uh, Titan. Uh, you're gonna have to make sure, that's why we told you to have your battery and, uh, and charger. Um, one point, just for the future, when we send out a list and it says battery and charger, um, it's probably a pretty good assumption that if you wanna code and move something, that you might wanna plug the battery in um, and get it charged beforehand. So, you know, for future training and references, um, please keep batteries ready to go um, and, and set up and charge. It'll just make it easier when we're going to do this. All right. Um, the training platform is, is wired up just like we did in one of our previous sessions. Um, uh, so he's good to go. Um, he's connected it all. So he's got the CAN cable connecting the two together. Right. He has his power in. All right. Um, set up. And I don't think there's anything else you need to connect right now for this. Right. Yeah, that one's wired for the motors and so on, but we're not using those motors um, as we're going and setting it forward. All okay. Right. So as you see here, I have my bundles of cables that are connected to everything on there. So first things first is I'm gonna plug the encoder cable from the motor in. I'm using motor two, but that's the motor that we use for the training platform. So I'm gonna pay attention to the pinout here to match the pinout on the Titan. So I'm gonna plug that in. It's gonna zoom in to make it easier for you guys to see. Not the problem. There we go. 
Next thing is I'm gonna plug in the upper limit switch. So you'll see there's limit switch high and limit switch low. Make sure they're in the correct orientation. So ground's going to ground and signal's going to signal. All right. Then I'm gonna plug in my lower limit switch in the port below it. Then I'm gonna plug my motor into the M2 slot. Ground first. Okay, so now everything is plugged into the program. Slide this over so that you guys can see everything better. Just trying to find something to prop it up through a small channel or something I can use. Battery here. Yeah. Battery war. Um, that works there. I got just the thing. That's okay. I got it. It'd be good to have. Okay. So here we can see the slide mechanism. And we can also see our two limit switches. Grab controller. So before we Did you lose the audio? Yeah. Just a USB-C? Yeah, I got it. It should be. There we go. Yeah, I think the cable that we have for our broadcasting system is not the greatest. Okay, before we switch over to programming, we have to configure the Titan so that it the limit switches are turned on. By default, they're turned off, and we have to go into the config software to actually turn them on. So I'm going to open up the software to show you guys. So we're going to use a USB-C cable that you should have included in your collection. And we're going to connect to the DFU port on the Titan. So if we see here, I'm using the uh, config and update app to connect to the Titan. So if I hit connect, I'm connected. You can see my CAN ID and some other settings. So by default, the limit switches are off. And what you're going to do is you're just going to hit enable. So this will enable the low limit switch and the high limit switch. Currently, this enables all four of the motor limit switches at once. And then here you'll see there's like automatic bounce back. You can, if you're using a normally closed on the limit switch, then you'd want to choose this. But we're using normally open. It is recommended to use normally open and not normally closed. And what we're, what we're going to do after we've enabled the limit switches 
Is it save configuration? And then we'll get a prompt saying your configuration has been saved to the device. And as this saves to the EEPROM, we actually have to uh, reset the Titan. So we're actually rebooting it. So you'll see there's a reset right where the USB port is. I'm just going to push it and it will reboot the Titan. And that way we're rebooting. And when it reads through the EEPROM on the first boot, it will see that the limit switches should be enabled. Unplug the USB. I don't need it anymore. Okay. Did it just drop again? I'm going to use this cable. Now it's not detected. No, that's for them. No, that's not connected to the computer, is it? Okay, we're back. So <clears throat> once you've rebooted your Titan, you should be good to go. And we can start programming. So I'm going to why is it going through? To the screen. Yeah. I'm gonna share my programming screen here. All right. So this is a, I opened up the 2020 version of VS Code that you should all have installed. And what we're going to do is we're just going to create a blank project. Or you can download the project link that we sent you uh, yesterday or this morning to some of you. And you can go from there and follow along, or you can follow along with me as we create the project. So I'm gonna click on the WPI uh, command palette, and we're going to create a new project. You can look for it, or you can type it in. As for me, it's right here, so I'm good to go. I'm gonna use a template, Java, and I'm gonna create a command robot. Select the folder to put this in. Here's good. What should we call it here? Elevator Project One. Okay. This Elevator, is making things. Elevator Project One. And uh, if you remember the team number based on the VMX Wi Fi code, by default it's World Skills 1234. So I'm going to use 123. And then create a project. I'm going to do it in this way. And right off the bat, it's going to perform a build to make sure and everything's set up correctly and everything inside here will be built as it should. I'm going to let that run. It should be pretty quick. All right. So inside, 
your source inside the Java folder, you get the code. Now there's some things we want to do before we actually start programming. If we look in the vendor depths, we don't have the Studico vendor library, which is required for us to program the title. So you can get that vendor library from our docs page. I'm going to just type it in myself. Okay, so let's to add it, we're going to go to the command palette again. Go to manage vendor libraries. If we want to install a new library online, and that's going to ask for the URL link. So our URL link is the dev.studica.com slash releases. 2020 is the year. And then studica.jp. So when I hit enter, it's going to ask me, do I want to build? And you always hit yes. Because what will happen is it's going to cache the library in your system so that it can be used offline. If you do not hit yes, you will not be able to actually build your code if you're not connected to the internet. I'm going to hit yes. And you'll see that I'll build again. But what it's actually doing is it's fetching the Maven repository cache of the library and bringing it over to the cache of the project. And you can see now that the Studica JSON is connected to my vendor depth project. And you can see that we are currently on version 0 0.0.161. So inside Roblox, which is the main uh, class of the project, there is actually a main.java, but we don't touch this, don't look at it, don't even think about it. You break it, you bought it. Yeah. Yeah. So mostly everything's run in this robot class here. We're going to ignore uh, the robot.java for now, and we're going to start creating the other sections of our code. So the first thing we want to create is a subsystem. You'll see there's already an example subsystem and example command in there. We're just going to delete that because we don't, we're not going to use those. So if you right click on the subsystem, create a new file, we'll call this one elevator.java. And you'll see, just ignore the errors for now. When we're done, it'll all be good. Switch over to my reference. So first things first is we need to uh, create a packet. All this is doing is saying that this uh, Java file is connected to the whole package of everything. And then we need to create the class. So public class. Elevator extend sub. So what we've done by extending the subsystem base is that we're telling the compiler and the controller of the robot controller and the VMS that this class is a subsystem. And by subsystem, we mean that it's one particular section of the robot. For example, your drive base will be a subsystem. Your elevator would be a subsystem. Your object management system would be a subsystem. And then you pair all your subsystems together and you write command to make the robot do. So you'll see that VS Code automatically added the import for the subsystem command so that we don't have. Now I'm going to create uh, the Titan uh, quad motor and the Titan quad encoder. So I'm going to use a private variable for it. Now as you can see here, there's an underline. That says it does not know what Titan Quad is. If I click on Titan Quad, the eyeball will show up, 
and we can import Titan Core. And you can see now that it's imported, it can go. Now we also want to add the encoder class. It'll do the same thing for this, so we're going to add that. Now we also want to display our encoder data so we can actually see what the value of the encoder is. So we're going to use the shuffleboard. So I will And I'll see we need to import these two. So I'm going to import shuffle path. And I'm going to import shuffle board. Then we need to create the uh, entry for the encoder. Get a default value of zero. So what this does is that in our display system of the shuffleboard that we'll show later, we've created a section that will show the encoder distance of encoder data coming from the elevator. So now I'm going to create Constructor. Now, as we don't have anything set up in our constant yet, I'm going to save this and then come back to it. So now we're going to go to the constants.java class, which is right here. It should already be there. You'll see there's code here already. We're just going to go into the actual class. to create the constants that are needed for our system. So first things first is we need our motor constant. So we have the ID of the Titan. Now, this constant here refers to the motor number that our elevator plugged into, which you remember was M2. So we're going to use the constant 2. If I was plugged into M1, then I'll use the constant M1. So I'd put here 1 instead of 2. Then we need to set the encoder constant. So the encoder constants is where we do a little bit of math. And this math will give us the distance per tick that we use for the uh, calculations required for the encoder to know the exact distance that we travel. So what we're going to do is this. So public. Um, I don't know, oh, okay. So by the pulley radius, what we mean is, if I stop sharing here so we can show, what you want to know is the radius of the pulley right here. 
Now, you can measure that entire, you measure it yourself. I measured ours in 7.5. If you have a wheel, for example, the mechanical wheel or just a static wheel or an omni wheel, and you want to measure its exact distance and input the radius for that. So you can get an accurate count. And then we're going to do the pulses for evolution. So what this is, is the actual resolution of the encoder on the motor, which in our case is 1,440. Now we need to add the gear ratio. Which in our case is two to one. So if you remember on the elevator, we had a 16, 13 tooth bevel gear on the motor shaft. And then we have a 26 tooth bevel gear on the output shaft. This creates a two to one ratio. So in here we put ratio two to one. Now we're going to calculate the encoder call uh, count for pulses per ratio. So this is going to equal to the pulse per revolution times gear ratio. So essentially what this is saying is that because our gear ratio is two to one, the output shaft, in order to get one flow rotation, will be double that of pulses per revolution. So if we look at the value here, it's showing 2,880, which is double this one. Now, the reason why we make this constant is that the code should be able that it can transfer from one object to another object. And that object might have different values. So I can simply just go in and change those values. And I don't have to change every part of the code that's required. So now we can calculate the distance per tip. So that is equal to math dot pi and two times slowly radius divided by the encoder pulse. So this is just some simple math so we know the exact distance traveled by the pulse. And as we use the pulley radius, in the value of a metric form such as millimeter, our output will also be in millimeters. If we wanted centimeters, then we'd have to change this to be zero, zero point seven meters. And then it will give it back to us in centimeters. If you wanted meters, if you wanted to be that big, you can go even more. But it's all based on the value of the pulley radius. All the other ones are static and don't matter what their uh, unit is. This is the unit that tells what your distance will come out. So we're now done with the constant class. And we can go back to the elevator Java class where we can actually set up everything to be correct. So inside the constructor, we're going to add motor is a new Clock. And this will be in for the time clock constructor, you need a device ID. So in this case, it's constant dot heightened ID. You need a frequency. I'm going to use 15,600 hertz. You can change that to whatever you want, but the tracker might just use that value. And then we need to specify what motor we're using. 
So in this case, it's constant dot element. So what this does is it goes to the constants class, looks for Titan ID, which is 42, and adds it there instead of us having to go in and add 42. So if we ever change the uh, can ID of the Titan controller, if you have multiple Titan controllers, you can set it up and it just auto does it. Then we need to set up the encoder. So we have encoder is equal to new tiny plot. Encoder. So the encoder class requires the tidying object, which is this, the encoder that it's connected to, and its distance per tick. So in this case, the tidying that we're using is motor. The encoder it's connected to will be the same as constants.elevator. And our distance per tick will be constants. Distance per tick. And when we boot up the elevator, we want our uh, count to be zero. So what we're going to do is encoder dot reset. So if I have a reset, you can see that what it does is it resets the count to zero. What this means is that when we start our code, we want the encoder count to be zero so that we know the exact count that we're getting. So now we need to create some accessor methods so we can actually read and set the value of the motor plus the encoder and everything else. So let's first set the motor speed. So we're gonna set the motor speed and we're gonna call motor set. And then we always wanna add a comment. So we have set elevator motor. And the parameter is a range of minus one to one with zero being stop. As you can see, that adds the comment here. So if you ever need to know what this is, you can see, oh, it sets the speed of the elevator motor. Now we need to figure out, hey, how do we read the encoder distance? So we're going to go public, double, and encoder. So what this does, it'll return the distance of the encoder. Now there's one more thing is that we want to actually display our value of the encoder all the time to the shuffleboard. What we need to do is we need to override the periodic function that it's always being shown. So update shuffleboard, and in here we go encoder dot set double. So what this is doing? Oh, encoder there. So what we're doing is we're telling the shuffleboard to update its encoder display every 
loop that the robot has. So the periodic function is called once every loop of the robot manager, which is roughly about every 20 milliseconds, which is fast. And that's about it for the elevator.jout. Now, before we go to command, we have to create a way for us to drive the robot. And to do that, we're going to use a controller. So you can use the Studio controller that's provided in the kit, PS4 controller, and Xbox controller, whatever you want. It's up to you. In this case, I'm using a PlayStation controller. That's what I have available. So I'm going to right click on the Java folder. I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it game pad. Inside game pad, I'm going to create a new file called game pad concert Java. The reason for game pad constant Java is we need to actually map out what button uh, the controller does and it's read by the control station into the robot code so we know what it does. So to do that, let's quickly map out what's required. So we have to, of course, add the package. Create the class. So the first thing we need to do is actually set the USB port for the controller, which in this case is zero. And then we want to set, we're going to just use the joystick for this. So what we're going to do is set that here. Our joystick. So as we're only using the right axis, I mean the Y axis of the right joystick, we're only going to define the right axis of the, I mean the Y axis of the right joystick, which in this case is interpreted by the control station as axis five. So I'm going to put five there. And that's it for constants.java. But we need to create an actual control subsystem class for the controller itself. So we're going to call that class OI. Java, which stands for operator instruction. So inside operator instruction, we're going to first add it to the package. We're then going to create the class. And we're going to add the joystick class. So joystick. And then create the constructor. Inside the constructor, we're telling the joystick what USB port it's connected to. And then we're going to create an accessor method to actually read what joystick we're using. So in this case, it'd be a lift double get right drive y, which is the y axis. So we're going to do a double join. Get our axis, and our axis is a. Constant, oh, no, not the USB port. You want there. 
return. Okay, so what we've done here is by this gets the actual value of the joystick, y axis. And what we've done here in the return statement is create a dead zone buffer. As joysticks are not always when they snap back to position exactly at that zero point, we want to create a little buffer to where they are in a zone where it might not be at zero, might be at 0 0.01. So we'll say, okay, that's that zero. So what I've done here is I've created a 5% dead zone. You can increase this if you want. So what happens if the value of joy is within that 5% then just send zero, otherwise send joy, which is the actual value. So we're now done with OR. So now we've completed the subsystem code, we've completed the gamepad code, and all that's left is the command code, and then some code inside robot container. So let's go to robot container first. As you can see, there is a bunch of code here already. Most of it we don't need. So first things first is I'm actually going to get rid of all the inputs. You need the package. Get rid of all the code here. Get rid of that. I don't know if we need that. So keep the constructor, but we can get rid of all the code after this. So we're just left with it. So in the class, we're going to first define our subsystem and the OI class that we just created. So public. So I need to import these. You see they automatically been imported here. And then I have to create an instance of those things. Class. So we have elevator equals new and or new. Here. Here. So we're going to save this for now, but I'm going to leave it open because we have to come back to it later. Now inside robots.java, if we go here, you'll see there's some errors. It's inside the autonomous unit, and so we're, we, can, we can just disable that for now. Same thing with polyop unit, we're going to get rid of that. And it's good. we can ignore all the other things happening. Close robot. We're going to delete example command. Because we're going to create our own command. And we're going to call this one elevator command subject. So we're going to add the package. Create the class. So just like we did with the subsystem where we extended the subsystem base, in this case, we are extending the command base. So now we need to bring in the instances that we created inside robot container. We're going to make them private.
will do the same thing with the OI class. Now we need to import OI. We need to create the a few constants here. So in this case, we're going to create the joystick variable. So this will hold the value of the right joystick. So double one. And we're just going to initialize it to zero. And then I like to ramp my joystick value so that it's always like a smooth curve and it's not just jumping. So we're going to have to ramp right one. Double up right on zero. And we have some ramp constants. So we have All right, we can now create the constructor. So, so the only thing that needs to go on the constructor for the command is that we say that it requires the subsystem elevator. So add requirement. And in this case, our requirement is elevator. All that right. Here we go. Now, because it's a command, there are some required uh, functions that need to be placed there before we can do anything. And those functions are this. So we need to add override for a public void initialize. There is a at override for execute. I'm just going to add all the functions first, and then we can go back and add things that are required in the function. Okay, so let's go over each function here that's required inside of command. The first function is your initialize. So anything that you want to initialize on first run of the command. Execute, everything that happens here will run every time the command is called over and over and over and over again until the command is finished or interrupted, which causes it to end. As we're always running this command, we're just going to call it's finished as false. However, if you're an autonomous, you would call it's finished to end the command. So in execute, we're going to add some stuff here. First things first is we actually have to grab the data from the joystick. So what we're going to do is input right is equal to oi.get right drive one. 
So now what we're doing is we're getting the input value from the joystick. Now we want to put it through the ramp. So the ramp formula is output red one, input red one, and previous value. Must earn negative. All right, so now we've created the little formula for, oh, and then we can. So that's the formula for creating a simple ramp with the joystick. But we actually have to now take that ramp data and send it to the motor. So we're going to call elevator set motor speed. And the speed is going to be the value of the joystick. Now, in our end function here, if there's any an error in the command, the system will automatically interrupt it. And we want to add something here to make sure that the command can handle that. So we're going to set the motor speed to zero, which ensures that if anything ever happens, it makes sure that the motor is stuck. So that finishes the command. And what we're now going to do is we're going to go back to robot container. And we need to say that elevator that set default command is a new elevator command. So what we're doing is by setting default command and setting required is we are tying the subsystem and the command together to make sure that they run properly. And that's everything in the code. Yeah. Now, you, you can see why we give you sample projects um, for a lot of this. This is one of the reasons why we also, um, we're going to give you more samples, okay? When we build the base robot, it will have all the different uh, subsystems and everything uh, already built. Um, so the idea is that you can either build from scratch um, or you can go and you can modify um, existing code uh, as long as you have a little bit of an understanding. But on this one, we thought we'd uh, put everything in from scratch to show you how all the, the commands and the subsystems are, are put together. Now we cross our fingers and make sure it runs. Yeah, I'm just connecting to the robot right now. Okay, so we're going to connect to the robot uh, via Wi Fi. All right, uh, James is it's called training um, dash one, two, three, four. Okay. When you get your um, VMX, they're all set by default, right? Are they all set to default? Or? Yeah, they're all default world skills dash one, two, three, four. And it requires a password, which is password. Yeah. Again. So if you see here now, I'm connected to the robot. You can see the current value of the encoder, which is zero. Uh, and you can see that I have the controller connected. 
Now, to just show you how I got the five as my derived axis, if I were to move the y-axis on the controller right now, you can see that the number five here is the one that's moving. You can also remember that we put the USB slot at zero. You can see here we have zero. All right, so I'm now going to switch to the other camera so that you can see the elevator. I'm gonna hit enable. And I'm gonna move the elevator up and down. Up's actually over here and down's over here. It just looks and I'm showing you here. Right. So you can see here the encoder value, how it goes up and down with me moving the joystick. Right. So in just the model that we have right now has a theoretical move area of zero to 175 millimeters. So this value is in millimeters. So right now it's saying from where we the carriage was originally, we have traveled 86 millimeters or 86.96 millimeters in that direction, which in this case was now I'm gonna stop sharing so I can show you guys a bit better of the video. So you can see I'm going up or down. So it is quite slow because we are going with a two to one ratio. You can split the uh, gears the other way around and you'll have a one to two ratio and it'll be super quick but you'll have less torque on the shaft. You might not need all the torque depending on what you're picking up. So it's up to you to decide what you want to use. There are also one-to-one -one gears you can use, et cetera, et cetera. So just to show the limit switch is working, if I were to push the bottom limit switch here, so I'm just gonna push it, I can't move the, uh, elevator in that direction. But if I let go, I can move it in that direction. So now if I push it again, see how it, it stops. And that's what's nice about the Titan and its limit switch inputs is that it's right there for you. So if I go in the opposite direction, it's being stopped every time I push the limit switch. I, I can't go in that direction. It's impossible. You can see I'm I'm pushing on the controller and it, it's not going. Anywhere. But I can push the other way and it'll come off. And I'll just go back. No more. So when you're designing your lift mechanism or whatever that you're doing, you it's always a good idea to have these limit switches just in case it were to go past the air. And as we're using an encoder, if we start the our round of autonomous right here, and we said this is our zero position, but we expect it to go 175 millimeters in the forward direction, it's gonna hit this limit switch. So what you need another benefit of limit switches. At the beginning, we can reset the robot by having it drive all the way to the bottom here and make contact. And when it makes contact, we set that as our zero point, or not even our zero point, we can set it as a minus 10 point. And then what happens is we can now set, if that's our minus 10 point, we can now drive this carriage up and down more accurately to our set points that we define. Right. Uh, so quick three hours, long three hours. Um, if you want to uh, keep uh, building and trying that, okay, um, the sample code is there uh, for for uh, for Java. But we don't have any sample code for that one for C yet. Um, but we just uh, we're working on that today. Um, as I said, we're going to continually do these little sessions and, and post little sessions. 
I'm just building a, a learning management system, online system right now um, for world skills. Um, in addition to that, we're going to put together something called design briefs for you. Um, so the little mechanisms you put together and how things pull together, um, there'll be, be a series of, of, uh, of design briefs that get, uh, get launched out. Uh, I'm not even sure right now, um, as we get back to full ability to work here, uh, maybe we'll send out a design brief to everybody um, once every couple of weeks or once every week. Uh, it just depends how we, we put this together. Um, feel free to try that code, um, bounce us a note if you uh, have any questions um, or any issues on it. Uh, lots of different ways you can change that mechanism or play with that mechanism. And we're doing all sorts of little things for you as well. Remember that, that the motor has a 60 to 1 gearbox on it, but there's a, a 20 to 1 gearbox for that motor. There's a 40 to 1 gearbox for that motor. Um, so we're playing with, uh, with different things that we can do. Uh, to be able to change the speeds uh, and, and so on as well, okay? Um, just remember that um, if you're at a competition and we're supporting the competition, if we think that that would be a viable option for you, we would make those available to you there, okay? And you could you could put them and change them uh, on the motor. But we like to point out the different ways to do things so that those ideas um, are, are definitely in your mind um, as you go through. So. It's uh, four minutes, 10 o'clock. Uh, this has been recorded. Um, we will um, post that up and we'll make sure that uh, Frank shares that with everybody. And uh, until the, uh, the next time, I think Frank sent out, there's a build a base robot um, over four days that's going to occur um, in April. I'm just doing all the interactive um, CAD uh, and the design for that. Um, but we would like to thank everybody for, uh, for taking part today. Um, hopefully you got a little bit out of it, um, lots of build techniques and a little bit of coding. And uh, stay safe, everybody, and uh, have a great week. It's the middle of the week, isn't it? Yes, okay. We had a holiday here on Monday, so it's a bit strange. All right, so take care, and uh, thank you, everybody, for participating today.